Please take your Bibles and turn back with me, if you will, to that passage that we read just a few moments ago, Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 through 35. Today we're looking at the plague of hail, part two. Uh, very hard to get through the plagues, as you know. Four weeks ago was youth rally, three weeks ago Father's Day. Uh, then we had the plagues for one week, and last week was Independence Day Sunday. So we're finally getting back to part two of Hail to the Chief. Very important, one of the plagues, and as you know, we're trying to memorize a budak so that we'll be able to remember all ten plagues in order. And I'm going to review it for you now because we've not been practicing because of all these interruptions. So they were blood, frogs, lice, flies, the murrain, and boils that we've looked at so far. And that is blow, fro, lie, fly, moo, bow. Let's try it together. Blow, fro, I don't hear anybody. Blow, fro, Lie, fly, moo, bo. All right, let's try it again with everybody participating. All right, blow, fro, together. Blow, fro, lie, fly. Come on, I hear it. Lie, fly, moo, bo. All right, so blow is blood, fro is frogs, lie is lice. Fly is flies, obviously. Moo is murrain for cattle, moo, and bow for boils. Blow, fro, lie, fly, moo, bow. And uh, the next one will be easy to remember because there's going to be hail and then there's going to be locusts, so that's halo. Everybody can remember halo, right? <laughs> okay, here we are. We're in Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. If you have your Bibles, turn there. We've looked at the names of the Egyptian gods so far, who theoretically controlled the elements God was judging. The plague of hail was against the Egyptian god Shu, who was the god of the atmosphere. When we looked at that list of gods, we established an important principle that we can always rely on. God never changes. We serve a god who never changes. That's the doctrine of immutability, which we discussed in quite a bit of detail when we were going through it. And that also taught us something else about the immutability of God, a second lesson. It tells you to do, when God tells you to do something, if you don't obey, he will, in fact, crush you. God will not broke rebels. He cannot tolerate recalcitrance, stubborn resistance against his known will. We've learned that the Bible consistently portrays the nation of Egypt as an illustration, a type, or a picture of Satan and the degenerate rulers of the world, and Pharaoh as an illustration of the degenerate leaders who rebel against God. When we looked at the cattle plague, the murrain plague, we saw that that was an attack on the economic wealth of Egypt, and whenever people make God their money, God will attack it. We talked about living in an information age where our wealth is transferred by electronic uh, transfers and of course we talked about the EMP I read you a rather major article that deals with that we saw that the threat of an EMP is so great that the US is currently moving its NORAD command back underground in the Cheyenne Mountains near Colorado Springs we talked about God's judgment in light of the Supreme Court decision concerning the redefinition of marriage I want to say a couple more things about that today many conservatives missed the key issue although they correctly oppose the redefinition, but that is not an individual rights issue. It's not an issue of majority vote, either by electorate, congressional body, judicial body, or legislature. Marriage is one of only four divine institutions established by God. God established four divine institutions. The family, that's marriage. The church. The government and employment or work. God did that in the garden when he cast Adam out. He said, by the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread. So when the government or anybody else begins to mess with any of these four spheres of authority by doing something differently than the way God designed it, such as the welfare system, you discover that you're going to have a lot of 
chaos. You're going to have destruction in other areas. You're going to have increased entropy, if you want to use a scientific term, that is decadence to society falling apart and falling into destruction. What makes any decision in any of these four divine institutions, and remember there are four, and God set the rules. What makes anything right is not how we feel about it, but what God says about it. It's not a matter of popular vote. It's not a matter of whether they pass a law on the subject. People say you can't legislate morality. It's not the issue. The issue is not what you think about it, not what somebody votes for. The issue is what has God said about it? We need to learn to think like Christians. It's not enough to think like a conservative. I want to recommend for your reading, and if you've got a pencil, write it down. I want to recommend for your reading the writings of Francis Schaeffer. I read all of his stuff when I was back in college. The first book that I read was Escape from Reason. It's an incredible book. Teeny tiny little thin book. But it tracks for you how we have gotten to the point we're at today, going all the way back to Thomas Aquinas, who said that man had fallen in every way except his reason, that he could reason his way back to God. And here we are today, because society has bought into that kind of thinking. Escape from reason. Read the God who is there. Powerful book. A lot of works by Schaefer. I won't list them all, but I encourage you to read them. I also encourage you to read The Christian Mind. The Christian Mind by Harry Blameyers. I read that either my senior year of high school or maybe my first year of college. It revolutionized my thinking. The Christian Mind. I also recommend for your reading A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life by William Law. Oh, how Christians have forgotten the holiness. And how serious it is in the sight of God. A serious call to a devout and holy life by William Law. Think like a Christian when approaching the issues, and there are a lot of them coming down the road right now. Think like a Christian, not merely a conservative. Pragmatism is not enough. Look down the road and see how your current decisions will impact the future. You've heard me say it before, but I'll say it again. Every decision you make will affect every other decision you make, if you're consistent. That's true in scripture, that's true in practical living. Every theological decision you make is building a foundation for something else to build on top of it. So if you build it in the wrong place, you're gonna be building the things that go into the future in the wrong place. Same is true in the Christian life. Same is true in your interaction with each of the four different spheres of authority in which God has placed you. You live under authority in four different spheres that I just listed. And the decisions you make interact with all four spheres of authority. On that same subject, I want to encourage you to listen to my message on Thursday, July 22nd. That will be broadcast at 10.30 in the morning, live from the Dean Bergen Society meetings in Garland, Texas. Think about how things interconnect, folks. I'm going to be talking about the Mormon holy books versus the King James Bible. So what's that got to do with what we're talking about right now? Okay, let me tell you. You may not be aware that there is a critical Mormon issue that has just been loaded like a bullet into the firing chamber of the Supreme Court's big guns, the Obergefell versus Hodges gay marriage decision. Do you know what the issue is? 
The door has just been pushed wide open for it. The issue is polygamy. Did you know that there are already more than half a dozen cases that are lining up with polygamists that are using precisely the same arguments, precisely the same arguments that were used by the pro-homosexual forces in the Obergefell decision? If homosexuals have the right to privacy in their bedrooms, What's the government doing messing with polygamists? They say, well, you know, you can't do that. Well, they also say you can't commit adultery, but are they, are they busy rounding up adulterers? They'd round up 40, 50% of the society. The exact same rationale, people not thinking like Christians, but thinking like the world, based on reasoning, going back to Thomas Aquinas in 1250. Folks, things may take a long time to get to their conclusion, but they will get there when they start down the road and are not changed. We've been called to be salt and light in our society. I suspect that within the next five years, how long it takes to wind some cases all the way to the Supreme Court, but in, within the next five years and perhaps sooner, all bars will be removed from the practice of polygamy in the United States. You have no idea how destructive that is. In researching this topic on Mormonism versus the King James Bible, and by the way, did you know that Mormons use only the King James Bible in English? In fact, they promote it. They celebrated its 400th anniversary in 2011. There's something wrong with this picture. They claim that that supports their doctrine. Oh, they officially don't practice it, although there are at least 17 splinter groups that do. Listen in. Thursday, July 23rd, 10.30 in the morning. And in the meantime, I know you've seen this. You say, why did he put that in the bulletin again? Oh, no, he put another one of those little ones in the bulletin again. Some of you dumped them on the table over here, pulled them out of your bulletin, took the bulletin. Do you understand why I put these in the bulletin? This is so that you will, please, pass them out to Christian friends who need to hear some of the issues that are going on. If nothing else, encourage them to listen to my message on Thursday the 23rd. This was not simply because you happened to lose your copy the previous week and I was hoping that if you lost it, you'd get another one. This is so that you can pass information on to someone else. Please, I encourage you, take these things and give them to a Christian who needs to know what's going on. Encourage them to listen in, even if they can't hear my message, maybe one of the other messages. Well, enough about that. And I do encourage you to send a birthday card to Jean Bryson. She'll be 92 this week on July 16th. So please do send her a birthday card. All right. Remember, the issue is not majority vote, legislation, administrative fiat, or judicial activism. Genuine truth has never been determined by majority vote, legislation, or judicial activism. Certainly not by administrative fiat. Remember the place to start with the question, and we talked about this. This is the application. I'm having a hard time talking this morning. What is right and what's wrong? That leads to two more foundational questions. One, what is the standard for right and wrong? And two, who determines the standards? If man determines the standards, everything is up for grabs and there are no absolutes. But if there is a creator, God, who made man, God determines the standards. And that's why the doctrine of Creation out of nothing is absolutely essential. That brings you to the next set of questions. If there's a creator, God, who made man, has he revealed his standards? And if so, where? 
That gets into the threefold evidence that you've heard me preach on, so I won't go over it all, but number one, creation, number two, conscience, number three, the Bible. You have to start with the right questions and the right premises, and don't be ashamed to say, thus saith the Lord. Don't fall back on, well, the majority voted for this or the majority voted for that. The majority may vote for something else that's contrary to Scripture. Our place to stand is, thus saith the Lord. As we've been looking at Pharaoh here, we saw that men reject the thus saith the Lord approach. Pharaoh rejected it ten times. But that doesn't make any difference. What matters is that it is true. And the only place to be safe from the judgment of God is, as we use figuratively, the land of Goshen with God's people. God's people had a little bit of trouble at the beginning, but when the heavy plagues came, God's people we're out of there. We talked about a series of principles concerning what the Bible says that you ought to do about wise preparation for contingencies like that. In fact, it said it twice. Remember in the book of Proverbs, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. And so we talked about the difference between prudence and wisdom and knowledge. We learned three things. Pay attention to what is coming down the road and prepare for it. Coming down the road, folks. Polygamy. Hiding from impending danger when possible. It's not only okay, but it's commended here in that proverb. Fools keep plowing ahead. They assume that it will never happen, and as a result, they get punished. We looked at many different things about prudence last week. We saw that Proverbs tells you about prudence that you have to get knowledge in order to have prudence. You have to get wisdom in order to have prudence. The second thing Proverbs tells you is don't tell anybody your plans. Very clear in Proverbs 12, 23. The third thing Proverbs tells you is what you know what you're doing and do your research and don't be received by the scam artists who are trying to sell panic plans. And we looked at that in Proverbs 14. The fourth thing Proverbs teaches, there are plenty of fools preparing in the wrong way for the coming crisis. And they think they can trick everybody into thinking they're not really prepared, like hoarding gold. And we, we talked about the stupidity of that. The fifth thing Proverbs teaches us is that prudence is when we internalize wisdom so that it can be taught to others, and parents need to be sure they're teaching it to their children. Prudence isn't merely book learning. You have to start there with knowledge, but it's the practical application of it. The sixth thing Proverbs teaches is that prudence is gained by listening to those who are older and wiser than we are, learning how they failed and how they succeeded in applying wisdom. Too many young people want to talk over you and give you their ignorant opinion. I run into that all the time. Learn to listen. The seventh thing Proverbs teaches us is that there is one more category of people who model prudence and from whom a man can learn prudence. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. And when we went over that, I told you about the rule that I established with Judy, which we called rule number one. Don't panic. It's a powerful rule. It's a biblical rule. It's a good rule for especially for girls to learn. Boys need to learn it too, but girls especially. There tends to be more panicky in the feminine nature. It's a biblical rule that God has given to Christian women. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel. And he's not saying you can't ever do any of that. This is not a support for Christian nudism, putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible. Here's where you develop your beauty, girls. Let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek, and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. And we pointed out that the word amazement is the Greek word toasis, rare word in the New Testament. It means panic or alarm or to be scared. And as I jokingly said at the time, most women, except the Amazon warrior types, the sword-swinging Valkyries, most women have a problem with panic and fear. 
But the passage also explains how wives gain the ability not to panic. They learn to trust God to work through their husbands instead of trying to take things into their own hands. Did you catch it? Verse 5 and 6. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement or with any panic. Sarah got herself and Abraham and Hagar and the rest of the Jewish race into trouble when she gave Hagar, that pretty little Egyptian girl, to Abraham to try to produce offspring. That's resulted in the Arab-Israeli conflict today. So marriage is another place and relationship that God has designed to teach prudence. Some people never seem to learn that. They fight their way through it, fight their way through it, fight their way through it, and nothing ever seems to work. How many times I've had to counsel families in that situation. Girls marry a wise and prudent husband. And then learn to trust God to work through your husband to give you leadership. Plagues and prudence, practical application of wisdom. We saw that for most people in America, money is their God. God says that is idolatry, just like the pagan gods of Egypt. And so as God destroyed the pagan gods of Egypt, gods can destroy the God of money that everybody here in America worships. It may come sooner than later. The third thing that we learned was God's purpose, never to go back to the old ways of the world that God called you out of. Don't go back. It's a warning in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Turning back to the old things in an attempt to save your life, your comfort, your lifestyle, the things of earth, going back to your old ways always ends in judgment from God and death. Suffering is never a reason to turn your back on God. It is never a reason for trying to escape suffering by compromising with the pagan gods of the world and the ways of the world. It's a major lesson of the Bible. Jesus said the same thing. Whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Paul emphasized the same thing in the book of Hebrews. I won't read all the verses related to that. But going back is always a temptation that we face related to our old sinful, compromised way of life. It doesn't matter where you find yourself in history, the principle is the same. Same in the Old Testament, same in the New Testament, same in the early church, same today in 2015. Don't go back. Be separate. God has called you out. If you go back to the old ways, you find yourself under the heavy and very painful hand of God. It's one of those lessons that the magicians in the plague of boils failed to learn. They had learned that God was sovereign in plague number three with the, with the lice, but with the plague of boils, they were still serving Pharaoh. They wanted the old way. They didn't want it. They'd learned that it was the finger of God back at plague number three. They couldn't duplicate it. So now God put that plague specifically on the magicians and they couldn't stand before Pharaoh because the boils were so bad on the magicians. We saw that God will send painful burning skin burns on those who will turn and curse him in the book of Revelation also. So that brings us now to the part two of the plague of hails. We've read that passage this morning. We saw that it's a very extended passage, 23 verses altogether in that passage, just like the plague of flies. God's message still hasn't changed as we get into this plague. He's making things harder and harder exponentially for the Egyptians. We saw that this plague, God begins to reach the heart of Pharaoh. Only time that Pharaoh's heart has been mentioned up to this point is Pharaoh hardening his heart, but God talks about Pharaoh's heart this time. And God says, I'm going to reach Pharaoh's heart this time. I will send all my plagues upon thine heart. You're going to learn to fear me, Pharaoh. I'm going to make your heart tremble. I'm going to give you a plague that's going to make you scared. And Pharaoh is scared while the plague is going on. But Pharaoh is a rather stubborn individual. As soon as he gets relief, what does he do? He hardens his heart again. God reached into his heart. God cracked it open. But the minute God withdrew his judgment, Pharaoh slammed it shut again. Have you ever been in that situation? God has reached your heart with something. 
There's a message that he's brought to you from his word. You've heard it preached here or on the radio or someplace else. While that's going on, you feel this repentance in your spirit and you, you feel a little bit crushed. You feel perhaps a little bit embarrassed. But as soon as it's over, you get in your car, you drive away, and you close the door of your heart. There are many people who do that when the gospel is presented and they're offered the invitation to trust Christ. They feel uncomfortable. They feel like, maybe I should. And they think, that's probably true. And I begin to think about all the fun things that they think they will lose if they trust Jesus. And so when the opportunity passes, the evangelist quits preaching, or the pastor quits preaching, or the person who's sharing a tract with them goes away and leaves them with the tract, they close the door of their heart. There may be somebody here who's done that. Maybe somebody out there in the internet who's done that. You've closed the door to your heart. And you know, every time you do that, your heart gets harder and the door gets smaller. And if you do it repeatedly, you may find yourself in the same position in which Pharaoh found himself at plague number 10. There comes a point of no return. Ten plagues, Pharaoh. Ten rebellions by Israel in the wilderness. God said, they have tempted me, that is, put me to the test, these ten times. Now, none of those who are age 20 or older when they came out of Egypt, none of them are going to get to go into the promised land, except Joshua and Caleb. Seems God is teaching us a lesson. How many times have you closed your heart to what you know is the will of God? There are many different issues, aren't there? You could have a thousand issues in your life, and on, say, a hundred of them, you've closed your heart ten times. It's over. Some of them, you may have only closed your heart three or four times. I hope you haven't closed your heart to the offer of salvation. That wasn't in my notes. We saw that God called the plague of hail a pestilence, never used of any of the other plagues. We saw that number five, Paul quotes the verse in Romans 9.17 that immediately precedes this area. For this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. God has a purpose, even for the reprobate. We noticed next that it was at least fascinating to me that God didn't say that Pharaoh had exalted himself against God. God says that Pharaoh has exalted himself against God's people. In other words, there are consequences for persecuting God's people entirely separate from the consequences for opposing God. Verse 17, As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people, that thou wilt not let them go. To put that in other words, there are serious consequences from God for those who practice anti-Semitism. Did you know that there is a major movement in evangelical Christianity to throw Israel under the bus. Some of those groups actually used to support Israel, but now they're saying 
Well, Israel really is the problem in the Middle East. That's the reason we're having problem with Hamas and with ISIS and with all the other terrorist organizations. It's because Israel is there. That's the problem. And so if Israel will go away, then we won't have that problem anymore, folks. That is stupid. God gave the land to Israel. We spent quite a long series talking about all the promises of God in the Old Testament related to national Israel. And they are unconditional covenants that God made with Israel. But there is a major movement in so-called evangelical Christianity today. Not just the liberals. The liberals have always hated Israel. All the liberal denominations have made resolutions at their national conventions against Israel. And they've boycotted Israeli products and all those kinds of things. They've, they've sold all their stock out you know, that they had in Israeli companies. I mean, they've, they've divested themselves of everything that taint of Jewishness to it. But I'm talking about evangelicals, folks. We're moving into very dangerous times. God said, you've exalted yourself against my people. You're going to suffer for that. This is the first plague where Pharaoh gets scared. Let it never be said of this church that we stand against Israel. The apple of God's eye. Eighth, God severed out the land of Goshen so they did not experience his judgment. God does chasten believers, but they do not come under the same judgments as the willfully degenerates. Ninth, the plague of boils was on both man and beast, but the plague of hail God included men, animals, and plant life. Tenth, we discussed before, God in his mercy made an option for human choice and accountability by providing one possible exit door. Now, we're not talking free will. I thoroughly believe in predestination. I thoroughly believe in election. But I also believe in accountability. God did make a door in his mercy. He told Pharaoh, you can get out of this one. You can spare your animals. You can spare your servants. If you believe me, you'll bring them home and put them in the house. Some of the Egyptians did believe, and some of the Egyptians did not. And did you know that what you believe always shows up in the way that you live? What you really believe shows up in what you do. You can talk it all day long, but if, it, if you don't live it, it proves you don't believe it. The people who believed brought their animals and their servants home. They raced to get them into the house. They knew Moses wasn't fooling. The ones who didn't fear the Lord left them out in the field. It cost something. Think about that. Servants lost their lives because their masters didn't believe God. It wasn't just an expense for the master. We're talking about people who died. You make the wrong choices and people may die. Every soldier knows that. Every sergeant knows that. Every lieutenant knows that. Every captain knows that. Every major, every colonel, every general. You make the wrong choices, people die. Oh, people, do you understand the seriousness of the lessons that God is trying to teach us through the plagues. Paul says these things were written specifically to teach us lessons. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And he deals with Moses and the children of Israel as he gives his illustrations. Eleventh. And here we're moving into new material here. People with a sheep mentality follow their leader. If you're a follower, make sure you're following the correct leader. Think about right now, there are over 15 million Mormons in the world. 
They are trusting their eternal destiny to the man Joseph Smith. Fifteen million. Three hundred and some thousand, according to the most recent report put out by the Mormon Church all the way through 2014. They had over 100,000 converts last year. People who believe that when they die, they'll not only stand before God the Father and Jesus, they'll stand before Joseph Smith, and Joseph Smith will either give a thumbs up or thumbs down. If you're a sheep, be sure you're following the right leader. One who is teaching the word of God, not Pharaoh, a leader who had great leadership abilities but refused God's commandments. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. Don't try to play chess with God. Pharaoh was counting on the fact that there were two crops that hadn't come up yet. Pharaoh was going to lose this chess match. Twelfth, the plague consisted of four elements. Thunder, rain, hail, mingled with fire coming down and ground running fire, not merely lightning. But the principal instrument of judgment was the hail. Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran along the ground. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was not like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread abroad his hands and the Lord, uh, under the Lord, and the thunder and hail ceased. And the rain was not poured upon the earth. Think about what you would do if you looked out the door and out there you saw fire running on the ground. Can you imagine what that was like? <laughs> God caused the Egyptians to experience this plague with at least four of their senses. Sight. They saw what was happening. Hearing, they heard the terrifying thunder, which seems to be one of the things that scared Pharaoh the most. Third, touch, they felt the rain and the hail. And fourth, smell, both the rain and the fire would have produced a smell in their nostrils. In other words, God was trying to get their full attention. But they still hardened their hearts. What has God done to get your full attention? I mean, stuff is going on around us right now, folks. Has God gotten your attention yet? What about that ground running fire? Some have suggested that that might be what's been called St. Elmo's fire. That's a flaming phenomenon which sometimes is seen in stormy weather at prominent points on, even today, on airplanes and ships or on land and is the result of what scientifically is called a brush discharge of electricity. We don't know exactly what the ground running fire was, we can guess. But I get the idea by looking at the text that the people were running around in terror from the hail and the fire that was falling with the hail and then was running along the ground chasing them. It says there was fire coming down with the hail, but then there was also this ground running fire. Can you imagine you're standing out in the field, bright sunny day, and suddenly, go whoo, these big chunks like this. In the book of Revelation, God sends hail that weighs 120 pounds. If that fell from a height of, say, 4,000 feet in the sky, 120 pounds, and it hit you, do you think it would kill you? I think it would. It wouldn't even have to be that big. It would be the size of a baseball that could kill you. They see the hail coming down. They see fire mingled with the hail. Then it hits, the hail hits the ground. Maybe it splatters, and suddenly the, the fire is running out from those splattered hails every which direction, and the servants are in the field terrified, and they're trying to run out. That's the picture that I get. Was God scaring them? You bet he was. And he was killing them, too. You're not dealing with a Mickey Mouse God. You will know, said God to Pharaoh, that I am the Lord God of all the earth. That's the God we worship, folks. I hope you worship him. That's the God the Bible presents. I think it was a rather horrifying experience 
Pharaoh gives a good example here also of what's called false confession and superficial repentance. Look at this in verse 27 and 28. Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my people are, I and my people are wicked. He's doing two things there. Entreat the Lord, for it's enough, that there might not be any more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. But you know something? Saying the right words is not enough. He says all the right words. It's an issue of the heart. That is why the confessional booth of Rome is wrong, and why a human priest cannot absolve your sins. Only God knows the heart. I don't know your heart, you don't know my heart. No man knows your heart. Only God knows what will be the response when he has removed his hand of judgment. Look at this. There are two, two problems here with Pharaoh's confession. First, Pharaoh had a very carefully worded, limited confession. You know, I've talked to some folks who used to be Roman Catholics, and they told me what they do when they went to the confessional booth. They said, you know, well, what we would do is we, we had a couple of really big sins we didn't want to tell the priest about. But, um, you know, we had a bunch of other little sins, and so we could make this big, long litany of sins, and uh, we'd go in there and confess them, and then the priest would say, you know, your sins are absolved. Uh, and he'd maybe give us something we'd have to go out and do to make up for it. But we didn't tell him the big ones. But we got the promise, your sins are absolved. That's what Pharaoh's doing. He has a very carefully limited confession. I have sinned this time. Oh, this time. What about the other times, Pharaoh? When you hardened your heart against God, what about those times? I have sinned this time. In contract law, that's what's called an exclusionary clause. So like Bill Clinton when confronted with the Monica Lewinsky accusations. Second, Pharaoh tried to shift the blame. Did you pick up on that? Did you hear what Pharaoh said? He said unto them, The Lord is righteous, I and my people are wicked. Yeah, but his people didn't have much choice in what was happening. As the old saying goes, the buck stops here. He's trying to shift the blame, a common trick that psychiatrists teach their patients, you know, like it's really your mother's fault that you have these problems. Pharaoh tried to include the Egyptian citizenry in the blame to lessen his own guilt. I and my people are wicked. He didn't want to bear all of the guilt. He hadn't learned that the buck stops here. Do you use those tricks? I've sinned this time, but God, don't, don't bring up those other things that I did in the past. I, I don't want to talk about those things. Or, you know, as Adam said, you know, God, it's really not my fault. The woman you gave me, it's her fault. But remember, you gave her to me. Boy, that's, that's the epitome of blame shifting. It's in all of us, folks. Don't do it. Learn to say, I was wrong. That's what David did. He didn't escape all the consequences. When Nathan the prophet came into him over the issue of Bathsheba and told him the story of the, the guy who stole another guy's lamb and ate it, David said, that guy's going to die. Nathan pointed the finger at him and said, thou art the man. And David suddenly realized Nathan had been talking to him about Bathsheba. David only said one thing. I have sinned. He didn't pass the buck. He didn't try to shift the blame. He didn't try to insert an exclusionary clause. Like she was taking a bath. She was naked on that roof over there. He didn't do any of that. Three words. I have sinned. People, when God puts the pressure on your heart, learn those three words. Otherwise, you may find yourself in Pharaoh's shoes. Moses declared that he knew Pharaoh was a phony even before Moses lifted his hands for the hail to stop. 
I'm going to lift my hands. I'll spread abroad my hands. The thunder will cease. There will not be any more hail that thou mayest know how the earth is the Lord's. And David says that too in the Psalms. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. <laughs> Moses said it back here to Pharaoh. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye will not yet fear the Lord God. And now we see the real reason. Hail is included in the judgments. God has used hail in judgment in the past. God has some horrifying judgments in the future revealed in the book of Revelation using hail. First, the past. And at least one other historical instance, God used hailstones to deliver Israel. The day when the sun stood still, the phenomenon in the heavens taking place just like in the book of Revelation. There were five kings, the Amorites, this is Joshua 10, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jamuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathering themselves together. They went up, and they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon, and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thine hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us, and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night and the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them all the way that goeth up to Beth Heron and smote them at Azekah and unto Makedah. And it came to pass as they fled before Israel. Listen. And were in the going down to Beth Heron that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in that day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of man. For the Lord fought for Israel as he will do during the great tribulation period when he cast down hailstones of 120 pounds each. There's so much more. Job 32, 22. Psalm 18, 12, and 13. Psalm 78, 47, and 48. Isaiah 30, 30. Ezekiel 30, 11. Ezekiel uh, 13, 13. Ezekiel 38, 22. Is Isaiah 28, 2, 17, 32, 9. Hag, uh, Haggai 2, 17. Do you understand how much is in the Bible about this? This is incredible. Psalm 105, 32. Psalm 148, 8. And then, of course, in Revelation, is in the middle of the trumpet judgments. I could have read you all those other passages. I won't. I won't even read you the one in Revelation. <laughs> it's found in the trumpet judgments. It's found in the bold judgments. People, we serve a God who is the Lord of all the earth. He's the God that I hope you worship. I hope you're in the land of Goshen. I hope you're in the ark. I hope you're in the fold. So many pictures given in Scripture of salvation. Because it is only when you are there with God's people that you have safety from the Lord of all the earth. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you once again for your power, your mighty power. Oh, manifested clearly in this plague of hail. Magnificent power. power that you use against those who have declared themselves your enemies, those who stubbornly harden their hearts, willfully disobey your commands, insist on their own rights based on reason, not on revelation. Our Lord taught us to pray, deliver us from evil, truly from the evil one who turns hearts against you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 617, Near to the Heart of God. We'll